All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, hello. Good evening, Indonesia. Good morning, America. Good day for our friends from all the rest of the world. It must be evening and night in Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand. Afternoon and evening in Asia. Morning and afternoon in Europe and Africa. And very morning in North America, Central America, and South America. First and foremost, thank you for uh, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to this international webinar that is attended by participants from many continents around the globe. We are gathering this day, all nations, citizens of the world, to be united for helping the people against blindness. Welcome to our 28th episode of Distinguished Maestro Lecture. I am Gede Pardianto from Indonesia. Let's start the webinar. To honor the origin country of this webinar, please pay attention to Indonesian National Anthem. To honor the origin country of our distinguished speaker, please pay attention to American National Anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, the maestra this time will be Professor Lisa Brothers Albiser. She is a legend, master, a friend of mine, the lady, a world-class eye surgeon. She is world widely renowned, leader in cataract and anterior segment surgery. She is co-founder of Eye Surgeons Associate of Iowa, a young professor 
at Moran Eye Center, University of Utah. She has graduated with honors from Princeton University and received a Doctor of Medicine degree with honor also from the University of Texas, Houston. She was served on the AAO Online News and Education Network for over a decade, as well as on numerous editorial board. Dr. Lisa is a former president of American College of Eye Surgeon, and she was an education director on the board of women in ophthalmology. She was among the top of 50 opinion leaders by cataract and refractive surgery today. She is recognized by the American Women Medical Association as a living legend of Iowa. And she was honored by to be a lifetime member of the Iowa Volunteer Hall of Fame. She has received numerous awards for her service and educational contribution to the AO and ASCRS organization, including two Secretariat Awards and two Peer Food Golden Apple Award for surgical teaching and has performed satellite surgery in the US and abroad. Wow, that is marvelous. At this very moment, she will present a very important topic with the title Middle Segment Surgery for the Anterior Segment Surgeon. It will be a really remarkable topic. Now we are learning from the lady who is a grand maestro in this field. So be prepared. Fellow ophthalmologists, let's pay attention to Professor Lisa Arbison. So Lisa, we are counting down for you. Five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. Time is your God with Lisa Brother Arbison. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to be associated with you and this wonderful program that you have that's really teaching people all over the world. And I've so enjoyed the previous uh, uh, lectures that have been given by the wonderful people you've chosen. I do have an unusual um, uh, concept here. I, I will concentrate on a couple of aspects of, of what people are starting to think of as a need for middle segment surgery. And of course, we've had anterior segment surgery forever and posterior segment surgery, fortunately. And sometimes the two don't really merge. Let's see, uh, it's not progressing as I shift. Do I not have control? Yeah, ah, here we go. Okay. Financial disclosure. Okay. And uh, uh, I do have uh, some, um, the only thing that might be significant here is uh, double capture. So, uh, we'll talk about hyloid sparing double capture, and um, uh, there are some patents. Uh, for around that. Now, the concept of middle segment surgery has to do with the fact that uh, uh, when we do cataract surgery, we're mainly concentrating on the limbus in and perhaps the sulcus and uh, uh, not very often on the pars plana. And our uh, posterior segment colleagues are looking at the uh, posterior segment, uh, mainly not from the retrolenticular space back, but further back than that, by and large. And there's so much that happens in the middle. And I want to credit uh, Sadir Hanush and uh, Christos and Fedidi and uh, uh, forgive me, I, I fantasize uh, with the concept uh, that perhaps either a new subspecialty or certainly a special interest group uh, might be something of value. And these are people and not a complete list uh, that are interested in same. So, uh, you know, examples of middle segment surgery would be cataract surgery complications that sometimes are difficult for the anterior segment surgeon to handle alone. Uh, bad lens uh, complex subluxation, which is becoming uh, almost uh, epidemic, as we'll discuss, and secondary implants, zonulopathy, uh, subluxated crystalline lenses are uh, difficult to tackle for many average cataract surgeons. Dead bag syndromes are just beginning to plague us now, and we still don't fully understand understand them. Certainly ocular trauma. Uh, and although there's a whole subspecialty of glaucoma procedures, of glaucoma specialists, uh, MIGS needs to be combined uh, uh, for the patient's benefit with cataract surgery. Uh, visual axis obscuration avoidance and the retrolenticular space 
are a particular interest of mine. Uh, and I've done pediatric cataracts for many years because my husband is a pediatric ophthalmologist. So I uh, functioned as his technician. For 10 years, I did everything. Buckles, that was before three-port vitrectomy and so on, which does help me. And uh, the question is going to be, what does require? Uh, what does it require for someone to be a middle, middle segment surgeon and do a good job of that? And uh, might there be future fellowships or just a special interest group? sort of like ARVO for uh, research, um, observation of others, video training, practice on artificial eyes. Uh, we estimate that approximately one to two cases per week would be helpful to really be proficient in these areas. And that means a catchment population, uh, which is huge, and maybe 50 referring ophthalmologists because experience comes with time and that equals better results for patients. And just to give you an idea in my career, because I've had uh, uh, over a 30-year 30, uh, 30 career, of all the changes that I've made, I don't expect you to uh, read this exhaustively, and this is available online, but just to give you an idea of the fact that I started with IntraCap and went on to ExtraCap and FACO on my own and FLAX, and then uh, went on to all these different kinds of changes. And this is really the beauty of ophthalmology because uh, it's an ever-changing field. We're always getting better and having new ways to do things better. So uh, this just you know continues to show you. Uh, I mean, our technology has improved from 400 cuts a minute, for example, to uh, we mostly have access to 5,000, but our uh, retina colleagues to 10,000 cuts per minute. So many things have changed over the years, and these are all uh, the learning curves that I have gone through, and and this means both effort and excitement over time. And I just want to point out that we neither want to jump on the bandwagon nor eat its dust uh, when it comes to these newer, uh, to adapting uh, newer procedures into our practice. You want to read the literature, attend meetings and wet labs, invest in simulation models, collect meaningful data to inform decisions. You know, it's one was once said, those that don't count, don't count. Meaning if you don't look at your outcomes and review your videos the next day and so on, especially complications that you might have, uh, you will be at a deficit for doing your best. Uh, we wanna visit experts where the surgery is never edited. So if we're interested in, in gaining a new technique, it's always a good idea to go visit someone who does it well. And one can consider hiring a surgical coach, which are few and far between outside of residencies, uh, but uh, that's something that some of us are, are willing to, to help people with. Uh, so reaping the benefits of giving patients the most up-to-date quality care can't really be topped. So um, we do need help from industry. Um, we need new sutures. Gore-Tex is off-label. It's uh, in the US. It's approved uh, by the FDA for cardiovascular surgery and therefore has the needles that they need. Um, 90 uh, proline versus flange techniques of 5 and 60 proline uh, are going to expose us to issues with, um, uh, with extrusion of flanges in, in, in the future, potentially. Uh, there, uh, we need new IOLs. Believe it or not, there is no FDA approved. So this IOL, though we use them off label all the time, and there's no pediatric IOL on label. There are issues with each of the above as secondary cataract or in order to save the day uh, when we don't uh, have a bag to depend on. And um, uh, certainly the PVDF uh, haptics on the uh, uh, Lucia uh, have been helpful, but there are rotational issues with that. Um, we can make a bigger incision and sew in a one-piece acrylic lens. Most retina specialists right now are using the Acrios lens, which is uh, a wonderful lens, but as a hydrophilic acrylic in eyes with chronic inflammation or uh, needing a desec and air bubbles and so on, uh, have a high rate of, or a significant rate, I should say, of uh, calcification and need for further uh, uh, intervention. Uh, we need better visualization. We have only rudimentary intraoperative OCT, and uh, the OCTs that we have in our office pretty well avoid the retrolenticular space, about which we know very little, and something that is really a very exciting uh, possibility for future exploration. So I want to start by concentrating a little bit on how we as anterior segment surgeons can do a better job when needed to do an anterior vitrectomy, I'm not talking about three-port vitrectomy here. And the unifying principles of all of it is to avoid intraoperative vitreous traction as well as postoperative vitreous traction as that 
vitreous will contract over time to anything it's attached to. Um, we want to maintain a normal tensive globe because that's the highest that gives us the highest risk when the eye is hypotenuse or the pressure changes rapidly of hemorrhage. We want to protect tissues from collateral damage, no reason to, and, and really we must protect our cornea in order to have our view and the patient's view and perhaps subsequent view for uh, other interventions that might be necessary in a complicate after a complicate. Application. No reason to chew up iris. And the capsule is our friend for the most stable way to implant an intraocular lens. Limiting the stage of complication limits the uh, uh, problems that the patient may have afterwards. So being attentive and uh, early recognition is important. And our goal as anterior segment surgeons anyway, is to leave a clean anterior segment. And if something were to drop, if lens material drops to the posterior segment behind the posterior capsule without being a true middle segment surgeon or a posterior segment surgeon, that should probably be left uh, for the uh, for the special subspecialty area that deals with that every day. And we want to implant only if we can implant a stable and preferably acrylic lens. So preparedness is important because the higher volume of surgery we do, uh, the lower the volume of unplanned vitrectomies we do. Uh, there's uh, uh, the latest that I can find in the literature from uh, Europe uh, collecting 3 million patients is a 1.1% PC rupture rate. And so uh, we certainly want to, uh, if our rate is higher than that, we want to remediate that and learn better. And uh, frighteningly, uh, the rate of bad lens complication, albeit be it five to 10 years on average after surgery, uh, is, uh, is approaching uh, that same number at 0.5 to 1%. So recognizing high-risk cases ahead of time, uh, planning carefully and having everything that we need at our disposal uh, or referring that patient if we really don't have those skills to offer uh, it makes sense. And we want to consider peribulbar anesthesia as opposed to our routine topical with intracameral and book additional time. I recommend that uh, we call a code V every now and then, you know, we're prepared for hurricanes and for cardiac arrest because they happen so rarely. So we practice and we should do the same for code V, have a clean vitrector set available and uh, just call code V at the end of the day and let everyone scurry around and make sure they know the settings, uh, have a vit kit because we want our cataract surgery tray to be spare and efficient. Uh, we want all those extra instruments we might need for complications to be readily available and sterilized. So when I say stages of complications for cataract surgery, what I mean is if we can catch something when there's just a broken posterior capsule with an intact hyloid, then we can have a case that maybe even is better than the routine. And we'll talk more about that with primary posterior optic capture later in the lecture. Uh, once there's vitreous prolapse into the anterior segment, then we need to really address that and do something about that. But if we let it go further to vitreous loss through the incision, why uh, then the vitreous has traveled further, which puts more traction on the vitreous base where the retina is a hundred times thinner than the central retina and, uh, and, and increases the rate of complications as well as uh, complicating what we need to do to manage the case well. And that may or may not not be complicated by retain, retained lens material. So early detection equals limited damage. And this can be very subtle. So for example, in this case, uh, you'll see, although I'm trying to protect the posterior capsule, boom, did you see that little spider? Uh, when you see a little spider like that, it's time to stop and control the situation and plan. Here's a much more obvious um, uh, evidence of, of, of uh, of rupture of the posterior capsule and anterior hyloid in this case. And you'll see that uh, actually it's a learning curve for this machine. First time I'm using it on, on a softer uh, lens and you see my rise time is high, which I would not recommend for a myopa. And you can see that even though I'm just on burst, whew, did you see that pupil snap? So that's the redistribution of fluid from the anterior segment to the posterior segment, and is pretty well diagnostic of uh, having a complication. And I'm I'm sort of uh, uh, dealing with that emotionally and mentally right now. You can kind of see my uh, my uh, adrenaline surge. 
uh, as I realize that I need to stabilize the situation, which is always the first maneuver, leaving the phaco tip in place because vitreous follows a gradient from high to low pressure. And so we're going to fill with OVD, not allowing the chamber to shallow in the interim. And once we've uh, stabilized everything, made the pressure higher in the anterior segment than the posterior segment, now we can withdraw and plan where we go from here. So um, my paradigm, uh, and everyone may have a different one, uh, is always to use irrigation anteriorly. Unless it's a fully vitrectomized eye, I do not recommend putting irrigation through the pars plana for the anterior segment surgeon. Perhaps the middle segment surgeon, when we have something more formal, uh, will do more of this. And there are a few of us, even without a fellowship, that do. And you'll see some of that from my brilliant colleagues. Uh, at any rate, uh, I like irrigation to be anterior because our goal is to do a limited vitrectomy and to keep vitreous from coming forward. So we want our irrigation anterior where we make the highest pressure to encourage the vitreous to stay home. Additionally, uh, if we were to place uh, irrigation in the pars plana, we absolutely need to know how to visualize that we're through and through. Also, because we're not doing a complete vitrectomy, we may cause problems at the vitreous base even with our irrigation there. So I feel that it's the safest maneuver to all always keep that irrigation through an anterior paracentesis, obviously with the port not facing towards the endothelium. Now, uh, if there's just a wisp around zonules, if we sharply cut that, we can amputate that anterior posterior connection and then trap it with OVD with an Arshinov soft shell. Uh, you've heard from him about that, and it's one of our more critical techniques of using our OVDs uh, to our benefit as tools. Uh, if there's a small prolapse, or certainly if there's no view through the pupil, then I recommend a biaxial anterior incision uh, of vitrectomy where both the vitrector and the uh, irrigation go through anterior incisions that fit them. We will never do coaxial irrigation uh, through the main incision as that will simply cause irrigation to continuously encourage more and more vitreous forward. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, the, 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 the low pressure, the, the way the vitreous will go will usually be around that coaxial incision. We want that incision closed uh, throughout our uh, handling of complications. If there's vitreous loss, meaning that it's already out the incision and the eye is soft or unclosable for any reason, then a direct sutured pars plana sclerectomy will be my choice and we'll explain why. Whereas when there's closed incisions or a planned vitrectomy, ideally we will go with a transconjunctival trocar system, which is always my first choice when appropriate. Now, Vitrectomy settings are critical to understand. And of course, we're always biaxial with tight incisions. Uh, I'd like to present uh, an idea that isn't the default. Our vitrectomy colleagues, our uh, VR colleagues, have really helped the anterior segment machine settings uh, to be established. And they're very uh, uh, prescient because they do this every day about where to be in foot position two or three. And understand that irrigation, foot position one is always irrigation, which continues into foot position two, which is cutting. And then foot position three is where we begin to uh, achieve vacuum or suction. And uh, for because we want no followability, because we want the smallest sphere of influence to prevent traction on the, on the retinal wall, uh, we always want to be cutting while we're aspirating. We want the highest cut rate available. The faster you cut, the less material comes in and the less we will pull on the periphery. Uh, uh, and we want our smallest gauge that we have available to us in our machine of our retractor. Uh, we want to balance that lowest effective flow and vacuum, we're in no hurry. So in the peristaltic machine, when we're setting our flow, something around 15 or 16, uh, 15 or 20, because we're in no hurry. Uh, but 
the way that the default is, the vacuum is actually set in a linear fashion down to 500. And we're not that good at establishing that in the heat of battle in a complication, which we do rarely. So I recommend that we go nonlinear and we set it so that we go pedal to the metal, get close to a little uh, uh, bubble or a fragment and see if it comes. And if not, then we slightly inch our vacuum up till it's perfect. And that way we're up in physics position two when we're moving around cutting and we're down pedal to the metal when we want to remove vitreous and it may change a bit because remember we're in a vitreous and an ovd filled environment not just dealing with vitreous it's critical we uh, do the bottle or the uh, the infusion pressure to match this so that the eye when we're in foot position three is nice and normal tensive and we want to withdraw while cutting so we don't drag any vitreous with us and then we want to exit on foot position zero different from our vitreoretinal colleagues because uh, they have done a total vitrectomy and therefore just fluid will uh, escape as they come out on foot position one continuing with irrigation. But for us, we'll simply encourage more vitreous to follow the vitrector out and cause incarceration. So because vitreous follows this gradient from high to low pressure, uh, and we want to minimize traction, uh, and because it's most efficient uh, and allows subsequent maneuvers with less likelihood of further vitreous presentation, uh, we want to consider this uh, pars plane, a one port pars plane of vitrectomy rather than biaxial whenever possible. It also won't unzip zonules when there's a sheet of vitreous around zonules and you continue to uh, remove vitreous from anterior, it can unzip those zonules very easily. There's also thorough removal uh, with amputation of any vitreous within the incisions because when we use a cellular sponge, we get capillary action and soak up that. And if we lift it, then we're causing tremendous traction. Rather, we should amputate that. Now, just to show you, this is courtesy of Scott Burke uh, and a, a cadaver eye a particulate identified with a Kenalog and with an anterior approach, you see that it will always follow and more vitreous will continue to come uh, from the posterior segment. So instead, here he's doing a direct sclerotomy and not exact fashion that I recommend, which we'll show you later. But you can see that with irrigation anterior and the vitrector posterior, the vitreous is pretty much called home. And there's no reason for it to come anterior so long as you keep the pressure higher anteriorly. So this is a, a good part of the rationale for uh, doing a pars plana, one port pars plana vitrectomy in complicated cases. Now, uh, trocar systems were very controversial and they remain off label for the anterior segment surgeon, but they are uh, the first choice of, of most experienced anterior or middle segment surgeons. And certainly you'll never catch a vitreoretinal retinal surgeon using anything but a trocar system. And uh, the advantages are that you do, it's transconjunctival, you don't need a flap, uh, it, uh, and, and it ends in is central to the to the wall of the of the retina so of the wall of the eye so that you're farther from the retina when you're doing your work and you're protected by the cannula uh, as you're uh, coming out uh, there's much less incarceration of vitreous in this way so it needn't be dealt with uh, dealt with most of the time as you always need to deal with it with a direct sclerotomy and the one major disadvantage of the trocar system is that it requires a significant entry pressure so we absolutely must have a firm and reliably closed globe. So this is what we're talking about visually. And uh, here is a Miyake, uh, an Apple Miyake modified view, uh, courtesy of Liliana Warner, where I'm uh, doing a vitrectomy from the front and uh, putting my vitrector through the tear. And you can see as much vitreous is coming forward as I'm calling back. And when we remove it, we often have a strand of vitreous that follows despite putting an air bubble first to try to keep it back. Now here we're intentionally making our tear in the posterior capsule and you can see uh, with the uh, particular identification that it has already escaped and it will definitely follow anywhere we pull out because I didn't fill with OVD first. And uh, now rather than sweep that wound or uh, 
or uh, use a wet cell, what we want to do, and sorry about the bubble, is we want to uh, use the vitrector from posteriorly, which amputates the anterior posterior connections of that vitreous so we can sweep or wet it out of the wound without any complication or traction. Now, I want to show you some pars plane incisions. Always measure three to three and a half millimeters back from the limbus. You're going to use here, on, this is an old video with a 20 gauge, and so I'm going to make it slightly bigger with the NVR blade than the 20 gauge NVR blade. You can see the herniation of the vitreous. And um, now we're going to place our irrigation through the anterior. And uh, we always have to keep that closed with a plug or a temporary tie suture. And I'll discuss uh, uh, really what it doesn't show it here, but we're going to use our vitrector upside down on the sclera to remove vitreous and maybe a little jot of viscote to push it back in before closing that suture. Now we're three and a half millimeters back. We have a nice closed eye. And so we're going to make a scleral tunnel essentially with our trocar system. And this is rather extreme in this case. I'll show you one by my vitreo retinal colleague early in my learning curve. Uh, this is, and then we're going to raise the hub uh, so that we can go directly into the eye. And you'll see that it takes some pressure. And you'll see the hub as we remove the MVR blade go sideways because I've not torn the um, uh, the floor or the ceiling of that scleral tunnel that I made, which I need to seal. I'm planning to try to do this in a sutureless fashion. And when I come out. Uh, you can see I'm placing pressure because there's, uh, uh, and, and really um, my retinal vitreo, vitreo retinal colleagues tell me to actually stamp that down with the, uh, with the trocar so that we get the floor and the tunnel to seal together. And then we have to ascertain that. So now here's a Miyake view of the same. And you see, we've, we've made that, uh, that scleral tunnel with our blade. You can see the kind of pressure it takes to put that in. I'm almost uh, detaching my Miyake uh, uh, specimen from the slide. And you can see how it, it, it goes backwards because of the tunnel that it's in and then forwards again when we place our vitrector inside. And now this is a three-port vitrectomy just to show you why it's important to either plan to suture for sure or to do a scleral tunnel approach because here's a direct 23 gauge entry and you'll see in this total vitrectomy uh, the kind of gaping hole that it leaves behind when we don't do a scleral tunnel that closes. This is a disaster uh, for the uh, anterior segment surgeon who's doing an anterior vitrectomy because that means that the uh, vitreous will plug that hole and create traction that will lead to tears and detachments. In the VR surgical world where they're doing a total vitrectomy, at worst, the eye is hypotenuse. So it's very important to suture. Here is a perfect entry, 30 degrees to the uh, sclera, uh, and then a short trip before we angle up and punch in. And you can see how the, uh, the collar is not flush to the sclera, but tilted. That tells us we have a scleral tunnel. When we go to close that wound, we must uh, be certain that it closes securely. And when we pressurize the eye, if there's any hint of a bleb uh, or, or inability to make that eye firm, uh, naturally uh, we'll place a suture. Or we may, if we're in doubt as to the integrity of that tunnel, uh, place the suture ahead and close it as we withdraw the cannula. So uh, what's our end point? We want to remove the anterior uh, chamber vitreous, anything uh, uh, that is uh, potentially going to cause post-operative vitreous traction to below the capsular plane. Uh, of course, we need to be much more extensive with that if we plan scleral fixation, because we must never uh, do any work uh, through vitreous before it is cut without traction. We want to amputate internal uh, incisional vitreous, sever anterior posterior attachments, not sweep. We want to maintain that chamber. Uh, we want gentle OVD removal. We don't have to be that thorough because we don't want to encourage vitreous to come forward at the end of the case. And uh, therefore, we'll always prophylax a pressure spike. And the next day, should the pressure be up, never tap the anterior chamber when there's been uh, a vitrectomy, uh, a, a, a lack of integrity of anterior and posterior segments, uh, because that will encourage vitreous forward as we acutely lower the pressure. So instead, we'll need to deal with that uh, with, uh, with drugs. Uh, so um, using a final jot of either washed Kenalog, which is off-label and in a, uh, in a vehicle that has 
as preservative, which is toxic to the endothelium, or preferably tree essence from Alcon, which is on label in the United States, uh, which is just triamcinolone acetonide. I prefer to dilute that uh, uh, nine BSS to one of the uh, of the uh, tr uh, tree essence uh, in order to be able to reuse it and not obscure the view within the eye. And uh, we'll uh, that confirms the vitreous removal. And at the last, we leave it at the last for its anti-inflammatory effect. We want to consider suturing the main incision regardless of its apparent stability in case there's further intervention needed or we certainly can't afford to have a wound leak in the setting of the potential for vitreous to come forward. And let's always use intracameral moxifloxacin, which is off-label still in the United States. Uh, cefiroxime is another option. Uh, that's a whole uh, lecture on to itself. And hopefully Dr. Arshinoff gave you that one since I've always followed his wisdom in that. That intracameral Vigamox, which is off-label, uh, can be just the Vigamox bottle, uh, as opposed to, of course, in India, you can get uh, uh, beautifully uh, priced and uh, um, prepared moxifloxacin, um, but in the United States, we don't have that available. Uh, so one, they even took the label, uh, changed the label from not for intraocular use on the Vigamox bottle. They took that off. And this would be Dr. Arshinoff's recommendations. I won't go through in detail. Hopefully you've screenshot this or you jotted it down. And there's the reference, uh, which really is very worth reading as is just about everything my friend Steve Arshinoff writes. So do what you know, uh, know what you do, <laughs> but no pars plana. And uh, there are skills transfer labs. I started one in 2006 on this topic at Ascaris. Um, there are eye bank eyes. Uh, animal eyes are a problem because you need a lab situation. Uh, they can't be brought into your OR, but the beauty of the uh, eye bank eyes is that they can. And my favorite model, I have no financial interest, is the simuli because of the way it's, it's constructed and, uh, and it mimics the real situation. Certainly, because it is controversial for anterior segments surgeons, at least in the U.S., to uh, be in the um, middle segment and posterior segment. Uh, it's reasonable uh, to accompany uh, your uh, person that you would refer your complications to, to make sure they're on board, that they know that you know what you want to do and uh, maybe even do it their way. So here's a, an example of a case that we could call middle segment surgery because uh, this is a subluxated crystalline lens. It's an eye with uh, spherophagia that we, uh, because there was no history of trauma, no other systemic evidence of uh, Marfan's or anything else to go along with. And uh, actually this eye had, uh, had surgery started uh, because of poor dilation in the office by another surgeon um, who uh, who then aborted the case when they saw it uh, fully dilated on the table with all the missing zonules. So um, here you can see I've not done a perfect job of centering that capsulorexis on the lens rather than the pupil, though that was my intent. Uh, but I did get that done because of excellent OVD stabilization. Uh, one can put uh, hooks uh, earlier as one creates the rexis if there's not enough uh, traction to allow it. Uh, there are many different types of uh, suspension hooks. Uh, these are uh, one of my favorites along with the MST that goes out to the equator. But these are nice because they actually just just hang on the edge and are well uh, and distribute the, um, uh, the, the tension along the edge of the capsular exits, which we can ill afford to use. Uh, here you see my rise time is nice and low. It's zero to minus one because I don't want things to happen quickly as, uh, uh, but rather slowly. And of course, uh, this is a relatively soft cataract. Um, we're filling the bag once we get it out after good hydrosection. Uh, because of these hooks, uh, we can do a nice job of removing cortex. And I like to start sub-incisional uh, since that's the hardest place. In this case, it also happens to be the best zonules. Uh, and, uh, and then be really routine about uh, removing that so we get every clock hour. We're going to fill that bag. And uh, uh, we've had um, uh, OVD over the... Uh, 
area that was open uh, so that we kept it compartmentalized. We're now threading through the eyelet. Although people sometimes think that if the patient's old enough, it's okay to use proline uh, in these cases. And this is a Sioni modified capsular tension ring. Today, we might use um, a ring and then an Ahmed segment to uh, put those together. Uh, but um, uh, although, and we want to be very careful about uh, our angle, and uh, uh, you can also hold on to the leading eyelet so that you don't put any pressure on the equator. Uh, but um, although people will sometimes use proline, uh, uh, Boris Malyugin uh, and uh, Dr. Anisimova, Natalia, and I, and others uh, have shown that it's actually not a matter of the dissolution of the proline, uh, but more a matter of the fact that our eyelets are not perfectly smooth inside and can cheese wire the proline, whereas the Gore-Tex, since it's a multifaceted uh, suture, will, uh, will be very resistant to that uh, erosion or tearing. Uh, I mentioned that the needle is the wrong needle. I like an ab external approach, external approach with a 26 gauge. And so I've flattened that needle because the curve won't allow it to dock. And you want to make a little space between the anterior capsule and the uh, iris with your OV so that you can safely uh, bring that into the right position from two uh, millimeters uh, back from the gray line, uh, two to two and a half millimeters. And uh, that's where we'll find our appropriate place uh, to suture. And uh, here we're going to uh, bring that out. And, and then uh, we have to be very cautious. So when we tie a Gore-Tex that we don't tie it too tight. Um, we now have both ends of that uh, double-ended suture so that we've, uh, uh, we've uh, make sure that the element of the Sioni is anterior to the anterior capsule. Tie that over the uh, ab external hole and we can punch it in so that it's 100, that knot has to be 100% buried. I feel very, and here I'm just enlarging the rexus because it wasn't perfectly centered when I did it. Um, uh, I'm very, very keen on not using cautery on sclera. I think the sclera is poorly vascularized as it is, and it leads to melts. I actually prefer not to do grooves or flaps, but just burying the knot and and reliably covering both with both tenons and conge uh, with an absorbable suture is uh, uh, makes this uh, a very quiet eye, and I've not seen erosion over 12 years of experience with that. Uh, now the lens can go in almost in the usual fashion. I'm putting some triescence uh, to be sure no vitreous snuck forward. And this case actually had a perfect outcome. So when we're calm, we plan proper, properly and we know what we're doing, things can go so well. Now, Steve Safran is probably the poster child for a true middle segment surgeon. Without a uh, vitreous retinal fellowship, he does three port vitrectomies. He does total vitrectomies. He picks up lenses and nuclear eye off the posterior capsule, out of the, out of the posterior segment off the retina. Uh, this shows a Yamani, which has pretty well taken over in many places in the world from glued. And it's so essential that you get all of your markings and parameters properly. And you can see here, he's just doing a masterful job uh, having marked, despite his vast experience, he always marks. And getting uh, that TS case uh, narrow, uh, small, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, thin walled uh, uh, um, can, uh, a needle so that it can uh, be docked and always check that ahead of time that the haptics will actually go into that needle. And now he's putting that in a position, not externalizing it, but putting it in a position where he doesn't have to torque the haptic, the second uh, trailing haptic very much in order to uh, dock that. And uh, I did uh, glued IOL. The advantage of the glued IOL is you're less likely to have tilt. Um, the advantage of this is that uh, uh, you uh, you really uh, have a uh, a small incision without really invading uh, conjunctiva and having big flaps, and you avoid the need for expensive and. Uh, potentially uh, prion filled uh, uh, fiber and glue. Uh, the advantage of this is that when you get it right, uh, we have the small incisions uh, and using uh, the low temp cautery, uh, it's critical. And I just wanna mention critical to uh, make any uh, flange uh, intrascleral and make sure that the conge and tenons moves over it freely so that it cannot later erode. So that was a masterful case. Uh, he never uh, shortened 
Martin's uh, haptics uh, when uh, when it doesn't center, but rather will uh, just assume that uh, the uh, uh, that the needles uh, the needle tracks were not perfectly symmetric, and he'll do that again. Also, always do a peripheral iridectomy with these to avoid capture. So uh, let's uh, let's take a little uh, a step back and uh, to a slightly different concept, a uh, different uh, uh, a topic within middle segment surgery, and that would be uh, work in the retrolenticular space. And you had the privilege of being spoken to already in this Maestro series by Marie Jose uh, Tassignon, uh, who is a, 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 a dear friend and mentor uh, uh, to a great extent of mine. Uh, you know her bag in the land is brilliant and unique and still not FDA approved. Um, uh, there, uh, but the, uh, this is something of great interest to me. Uh, and uh, the, the anatomy is surprisingly poorly known, poorly understood. Really, it was in the 18th century that people were really exploring the retrolenticular space. And as I mentioned, our OCT, our imaging doesn't help us very much. Uh, it's critical to understand this area, both for understanding accommodation, uh, posterior vitreous pressure. I wrote an article showing that uh, with anterior vitreous detachment and fluid uh, BSS flowing behind the lens, behind the uh, interburger space, that will cause the capsule, posterior capsule to bow forward and increase the rate of complications. We want to understand all the issues associated with anterior vitreous detachment. Uh, we're all fixated on posterior of interest detachment, and this has some real significances that we're, we're, we've yet to learn the extent of. Uh, zonular pathologies, of course, uh, are all associated with this, and we'll understand misdirected aqueous syndromes better, too. So it's a frequent, uh, a very fruitful focus uh, for us in the future. So uh, this um, uh, is just a schematic of the uh, uh, burger space uh, with the posterior capsule above, the anterior hyloid, which is the true barrier between the anterior and posterior segments, the true structure that makes uh, a two-chambered eye, uh, a healthy two-chambered eye, and the posterior capsule is redundant to the anterior hyloid membrane, which wraps all the way around the ciliary body and such. And then Weger's ligament circumferentially delineates this potential or real space called Berger space between the posterior capsule and the anterior hyloid. And uh, the posterior zonules are attached to the ciliary body, holding the lens in place. Now here is, it's a little hard to see, which is why I call it uh, intraoperative um, uh, uh, OCT rudimentary. But here you can see the uh, posterior capsule, the anterior hyloid. And this is Marie Jose's surgery. She, you can see her making the hole in the anterior capsule here. And uh, then uh, you can see how the hyloid kind of tends to be very diaphanous and almost herniate through that. So she's using cohesive OVD now uh, through that uh, hole in the posterior capsule. And you can see the anterior hyloid just move backwards in this lovely fashion, delimiting burger space. And you could see the, high, the OVD fill into itself over there uh, in burger space. And um, now she's going to perform the uh, posterior capsular excess, in this case, a primary one. Uh, the bag in the lens requires perfectly centered, perfectly sized anterior and posterior uh, capsular continuous capsular rexes, uh, which um, my concept of hyloid sparing double capture, which we'll talk about briefly uh, soon, uh, does not require such perfection. Uh, and you can see on the OCT how she's accomplished this. And the hyloid stays back without any hint of herniating forward. So um, detachment of Weigert's ligament is very uncommon, as far as we know, uh, in, the, uh, in the usual state. But there are conditions in which it may detach. And lots of things that we don't understand about the consequences of that, including uh, my mention of the pushing forward of the, end of the posterior capsule and complications. 
Well, why would we bother to master the posterior capsule? You know, anterior segment surgeons have just been trained to like, just don't touch the thing. I mean, you know, if you got to polish it a little fine, but we need to leave that intact. Uh, but honestly, uh, that's not necessarily the ideal situation. And uh, one of the reasons is to convert an unstable posterior capsule tear to enable in the bag implantation. Because even if, uh, if we use the phaco by mistake to uh, puncture the posterior capsule, and even if it looks round, it will tear easily. It needs to finish outside of where it began, just as Howard Gimbel and Noyhan described as the continuous uh, circular capsularexis. And so uh, we need to know how to deal with that posterior capsule to make a stable situation out of an unstable one, which I'll show you some more about later. Uh, we want to allow immediate vision in unpolishable plaque cases. People with an unpolishable plaque won't have their best vision right off the bat after cataract surgery. And I have so many videos of, uh, of removing that uh, primarily. The other disadvantage is that we have to wait at least three months or until we decide the eye is no longer inflamed because uh, we, um, particularly in an early ag where there's not enough fibrosis yet, we really convert that two-chambered eye to a one one chambered eye, almost always opening the anterior hyoid along with the posterior capsule with the YAG uh, posterior capsulotomy. So uh, these patients are way more prone if we don't take care of it initially at the time of surgery so that there won't be uh, a capsular opacity early, uh, particularly prone to CME and other problems. So we want it also for optic capture, certainly of a subluxated lens or a toric lens that's, con that's rotated despite being replaced, we can always be certain the lens will stay in the right place if we optic capture, meaning the haptics are somewhere different, for, uh, are on one side of an unterrible membrane from the optic, which is on the other and to assure stable implantation, as I said, of the toric lens. Now, here's an example of a case where um, I, I always keep the chamber formed. So whenever I remove my phaco, I always uh, replace uh, the chopper with uh, BSS, uh, sort of a poor man's chamber maintainer while I switch to the INA. And when I remove the IOA, INA, I do the same uh, to, until I put the OBD in. And here you can see there's a strangely uh, oh, uh, um, clear area, which implies uh, that there's uh, a hole in the posterior capsule. And in fact, when I put my OVD through there, I can see it fall backwards rather than form into itself. So right away, I, I, I'm hoping there's no vitreous prolapsed and I'm going to take the little edge. You can always use a little Vana scissor if there's no good edge to grab. And I'm going to convert this tear into a, a continuous rexus. Now, if I I have significant prolapse vitreous, even though I've tried to control that chamber, it will be hard to pull that uh, uh, diaphanous uh, uh, four to six micron thick membrane around. And so if I encounter problems with that, then I need a one port pars plane of vitrectomy to eliminate the prolapsed vitreous and then I can uh, make it continuous. And here you see I've succeeded in making it continuous. So even though I have um, uh, this is a toric case, and in the U.S., we only have one-piece PMMA toric lenses, which I want to put in the bag, which is why I've gone to the trouble uh, to, uh, to make sure uh, that I, I have a, an intact, uh, a secure posterior capsule. It's not intact, but it has a continuous rexus. So I can not only implant my toric implant, but I can even gently and carefully rotate that to the proper position. Uh, and uh, as long as I uh, keep uh, the chamber formed in removing the, uh, uh, the OVD uh, and uh, it's nice to bring the pupil down, uh, then we can have a very lovely outcome of that case. Now, you can see, you might say, well, I don't want to prolong my case, but here's someone who's done hundreds, if not thousands, of posterior capsulotomies. And you can see it adds 33 seconds, basically, to the case. You see her uh, filling this in. Uh, Rupert Menapachi has, who should also really be one of your, uh, I think, one of your uh, maestros, uh, has done amazing work on posterior capsulotomy and posterior optic capture with a three-piece lens, sulcus, uh, implanted haptics with the optic captured through the, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, a three-piece lens 
uh, bag implanted haptics with the uh, optic into burger space under the posterior capsule. And he's done beautiful prospective randomized trials showing that it's definitely non-inferior. Uh, here is a case in which I put this very much to use because the place to learn about posterior capsulotomy is in patients who cannot, uh, uh, who cannot sit for a YAG. So here's an example of the type of lens you might see in Malaysia, perhaps more often uh, than the US, but in Iowa, uh, I was the go-to person for brunettes and cataracts. And this is a patient who's mentally handicapped and uh, therefore uh, cannot sit for the ad, cannot sit for an exam. So it's an exam under anesthesia. And I'm using my technique, another uh, lecture that I'd be delighted to give at any time, uh, that I call circumferential disassembly. And what I'm doing here is I'm finding basically that plane of the endonucleus, which is present even in the most mature uh, cataract. Of course, we can't hydrodelineate it like we can a, um, a lens that is um, uh, uh, that is uh, very immature, uh, but it's still there. So my goal is not to make the uh, the uh, crack, the uh, the chop, the vertical chop, uh, all the way through the poster the poster plate, because then I have to separate it, and those leathery fibers are going to be a problem. But rather to open little tiny cracks, so that then I can begin to remove uh, or or debulk the lens from the inside out. And I'm, uh, this is a bilateral, same day sequential bilateral cataract surgery case, which of course requires uh, intracameral uh, antibiotic, moxifloxacin having many advantages. Uh, and, um, and then my plan, because this patient would otherwise need general anesthesia for the first eye, general anesthesia for the second eye, general anesthesia for a decision on the first eye or the second eye, my plan is to do a posterior optic capture, which Menapachi has shown, at least in adults, will decrease the rate of visual axis obscuration to virtually nil. So you can see uh, we're slowly with a burst mode, and there's a whole lecture on this subject, getting down to the uh, a uh, uh, posterior plate and uh, basically going soon to uh, uh, remove the nucleified epinucleus, uh, which, uh, so in this way, we're using just little bursts, and I've left some sound on that maybe you can hear from the second eye. You can hear I'm just using the phaco just to essentially gain purchase on the lens so we can apply our mechanical forces with a not sharp chopper. Uh, and a uh, rosin splitter is my preference, a very old instrument, and then uh, uh, wait till we hear uh, that it's occluded and, uh, and assist aspiration flow, protecting the posterior capsule. So you can see uh, these are two eyes that are not obviously being done simultaneously, but uh, sequentially, but I'm showing them simultaneously. The, uh, eye, the left eye had a less, slightly lesser cataract, so I'm ahead on that one. And uh, you can see I'm being very thorough. Even these very mature cataracts still have quite a bit of cortex way out in the periphery. We're going to use a bevel up 30 gauge needle to ski a little, a little bit of a crease so that we ski the posterior capsule up off of the anterior hyoid, which may be far behind or very close behind the posterior capsule. And now we're putting OVD. Uh, through that hole that I made, that little uh, opening, a little flap, really, that's going to go around. And I'm always going to measure my anterior rexus to be sure it's capturable as my fail-safe before I would do a, an elective primary posterior capsular rexus. And now I'm going to make this posterior rexus a little smaller than the anterior rexus. It's much more elastic and forgiving, and so it doesn't have to be quite as big. And I think it's important to make it a little bit smaller for a uh, three-piece lens. We're not going to be okay. able to can capture a one-piece, but because the yeah. optic-haptic junction is so broad, it will not as likely uh, keep vitreous from herniating. Here I'm even enlarging that posterior rexus a little because I just wanted a little more generous on that side. Maybe that was gilding the lily a little unnecessary. And uh, now I'm uh, I've 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 I'm carefully I've raised the uh, uh, bag uh, to give me my spare tire landing zone with OVD, and I'm placing my uh, uh, leading haptic carefully above the posterior capsule and below the anterior capsule, and rotating it into the bag. And now we're going to walk the 
optic into burger space so that we have the posterior capsule from haptic junction to haptic junction in this cat eye football appearance and the anterior capsular rexus remains round. And we don't need to remove OVD from the captured area in the posterior segment. Uh, it will not have access to the trabecular meshwork. Menapachi convincingly showed us it will not raise pressure, but of course we want to raise, we want to remove OVD from the anterior segment above the capture and not allow uncapture. Now, another uh, little uh, uh, thing that I wanted to talk about is bag lens subluxation. And, you know, with the standard in the bag procedure, even carefully done with a CTR in the bag, which does not prevent phimosis, we can see this and need to use a YAG laser for anterior relaxing incisions. If you, oops, sorry, uh, if you, if you do that, um, uh, uh, if you if you do have an eye with significant zonular laxity uh, uh, and you place a lens in the bag, be sure and dilate them in the early postoperative period because it's very likely that they will early on phimose. And of course, what we're hoping to avoid is bag lens subluxation, as you see down here. So for years, uh, I and then my colleague David Chang, another one of your maestros, um, uh, uh, adapted uh, the concept of placing a CT are in the bag, uh, but, um, and I'm almost out of time. I can't believe it. Uh, no, I'm not quite. Um, uh, and then um, capturing, uh, and then placing a three-piece lens in the sulcus and capturing through the anterior rexus. You have to be sure you get the OVD out of the bag so you don't uh, have, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the OVD absorbed fluid behind. At any rate, uh, this makes for a much more stable eye. Uh, and we don't have good long-term data that tells us for certain that it won't bag and lens subluxate, but uh, uh, you won't see pseudophagodenesis like you do if the lens is in the bag in these very unstable cases. And uh, they all, however, need a YAG. So I came, uh, the idea came to me for hyaloid sparing double capture uh, to reduce that. Maybe it will reduce bag lens subluxation. And in fact, it's sort of like the bag in the lens in a way. Uh, we know that it will have zero PCO. Uh, and the anterior capture from the sulcus to block phimosis for loose zonules, uh, we get the advantage of that. Element. And, and, and so when we uh, put a three-piece lens in the sulcus, capture through both anterior and posterior capsules into burger space, and it simulates the bag in the lens in terms of antigen sequestration, uh, but it is, uh, its centration isn't based on, the, uh, is based on the sulcus, the haptics in the sulcus, and not zonule dependent, and we can use any FDA-approved a uh, three-piece IOL uh, that, uh, although ideally it would have a 90-degree optic haptic junction. So here's a trauma case where I did that, not so much electively, but it had some zonular lysis, but the other zonules were solid because it was trauma. Uh, and as you see, irido, uh, an irido, um plegia and, uh, uh, and also, you know, torn away from the root. And what I'm doing, it had a fibrous posterior capsular opening already. And so what I'm doing is I'm capturing, I've put the lens in the sulcus and I'm capturing the optic through both anterior and posterior capsules. Um, and that posterior fibrosis is very, very sturdy. The reason to wait a while after trauma when you can keep the eye quiet and safe um, so that fibrosis will allow you to use a capsule that if you had an immediate tear in that capsule could never be capturable without changing to continuous. So this led to a very stable situation and it led me to the concept of uh, doing this in a routine planned fashion for certain cases. And I here's, uh, I hope this way. is uh, going to run way. for you. Yeah, okay. Um, and hopefully you can hear the sound. Can somebody tell me, yes, you can hear the sound? I'm going to assume you do and not speak over him. Very low. Very low. Uh, well, um, it's as loud as I can get it to be. So uh, I will uh, perhaps speed through this. And the concept is that uh, uh, he's actually teaching a resident, Tom Oding, who uh, is another brilliant surgeon in our midst, um, uh, is uh, based on my recommendation uh, in a, uh, a young child with uveitis who lost the other eye from complications of uh, a routine surgery with immediate uh, posterior axis obscuration 
and all kinds of um, uh, inflammation in the eye. And uh, so he's taking my advice to do this um, uh, a double capture. And I'm going, I don't know if I can skip ahead. I may or may not. It doesn't look like I can, unfortunately. Uh, at any rate, he's uh, carefully making, he likes to use an MA50. So he has a larger optic. Um, I'm not sure that's uh, my favorite choice. Uh, but what he's done is he's made an anterior rexus and uh, he's placed a CTR in. And when you have loose zonules, it's helpful to place a CTR before doing the posterior rexus. Um, this is uh, one of his, for it, it, I I, I believe his first case. So you can see that Apache says the learning curve is maybe 150 cases and uh, it's uh, very rare to have vitreous present. But if you if it does, you can uh, take care of that and you have an anterior capsulorexis through which you can capture uh, from the sulcus as a backup or um, or forward uh, capture if necessary. And you can see here now he's uh, going ahead and making the posterior rexus and uh, then he will uh, double capture this case. And um, are we fine on time, Dr. Getty? Do you mind if I continue? To stop it from going out. And uh, this goes down nicely. I'm going to hope that he's saying yes. I can't really hear. Um, at any rate, uh, then he's going to place the lens in the bag and then capture through, uh, excuse me, he's going to place the lens in the sulcus and then capture through both the anterior and the posterior capsules. And uh, this led to a very quiet eye for this child uh, who ended up with excellent vision. Uh, interestingly, five years later, she did opacify the anterior hyloid, uh, most likely because we don't have a 90 degree optic haptic junction, but by then she could sit at the YAG and it took like two shots to open that anterior hyloid. Um, our goal, however, in adults is that there should be a zero PCO rate. So the question is, wouldn't it be nice if this were our result for life? And in fact, there's uh, less in the way of, um, of uh, vitreous, uh, less in the way of uh, stray light from no capsule versus an intact clear capsule, rather than uh, post YAG having experienced a secondary period of uh, visual obscuration. Do we have time to go on to trauma? Yes. Yeah, sure. Very good. Uh, so uh, I'd like to show you a trauma case presentation and without skills in the middle segment and confidence about how you would handle uh, these kinds of things, it'd be very hard to take care of such a case. An 11 year old boy presents with a total, uh, a near total hyphema after a BB gun injury uh, of the closed uh, eye. And um, he had hand motion vision with projection, uh, excellent projection. Uh, his IOP was uh, 30 uh, and controlled on meds. Uh, there was no reverse ap uh, pupillary, afferent pupillary defect, which needs to be done with um, neutral density filters in order to be able to tell that. And, uh, and we saw that the retina was attached um, uh, by OCT. So uh, we were able to manage conservatively, which is always the goal with steroids to reduce uh, inflammation with topical hypotensives. To and as long as you can control that pressure the, uh, and weight, the hyphema will absorb and the eye will quiet. This BB gun injury hit the closed lid and resulted in a total hyphema, which cleared over a period of weeks. Dr. Getty, brought him to surgery, enough? expecting the potential for aphakia, forming a chamber, planning no irrigation, uh, not knowing where the capsule was open and where the capsule was closed or whether there was vitreous forward. We marked with particulate identification with triessence and then with tripan blue. Our goal is not to create any turbulence whatsoever, but rather to do manual removal of this soft flocculent material and to explore the uh, various planes in order to reconstruct the anterior chamber. Uh, it's best if one can quiet the eye and uh, this patient was controlled on three drops with his pressure and um, our B scan and reverse afferent showed us that uh, the posterior segment was intact and so we were capable of waiting for fibrosis to occur. Here I am uh, working uh, to find uh, the plane between the posterior synechia of the avulsed iris and the open area of capsule and I'm just uncovering this at this point both by sharp and blunt dissection. 
always being mindful to keep the eye normal tensive to avoid turbulence and therefore no irrigation so that we don't lose any capsule or cause any tear to break around the equator and we don't encourage vitreous to come forward. Manitol was given a quarter of a gram per kilogram IV push prior to beginning the surgery, actually as soon as the IV was in place. And uh, we're continuing to gently take care of the synechia. We um, want to remove all possible cortex ultimately to reduce inflammation. And so we'll work diligently at that. And uh, no matter how much tripan we instill inferiorly, we see there's uh, no capsule below, but we've discovered anterior capsule above. Now we're breaking the posterior synechia above, and then we'll uh, pull the iris out of the angle to hopefully allow the angle to function better as this was occluded by the iris. So once we get things free, uh, and identify our planes. Trying to uh, use, once again, visco dissection, blunt dissection, always aspirating cortex, never irrigating. Now we're ready to pull the iris out of the anterior superior angle. And as uh, luck would have it, uh, that area did begin to function again, as in the post-operative period, the patient did beautifully, uh, allowing uh, pressure maintenance without drops. Now, I like to use a little epinephrine in my sub injection of lidocaine, and that's really the only reason I'm uh, doing that subconscious injection with general anesthesia, is to create a little hemostasis, which uh, isn't particularly wonderful, but my goal is to avoid all cautery. In my opinion, the sclera is poor enough vascularized, and so we want no cautery, and uh, would rather allow vessels to uh, heal on their own. It was a very challenging pass here because of the tight orbit. We have to be careful we don't contaminate needles by letting them go through the drape. And of course, uh, this is a double-armed 10-O uh, proline because there will be no stretch, no eyelet to cheese wire, I feel the 9-0 uh, is unnecessary in this case uh, of iridodialysis repair. Uh, these are double-armed and we're planning two double-armed mattress sutures which naturally uh, have to be buried. Uh, we like to tie them a little bit loose so that we don't cover the angle below uh, but just have them in apposition and so here I'm pulling it out to be sure, bearing the knots appropriately. And at this point, uh, we uh, are making a decision. The family was prepared for the patient to remain aphakic. Uh, however, uh, though I don't feel comfortable using a three-piece, uh, a one-piece lens, uh, because the haptics could become bared, I feel that a three-piece with a two-handed approach like this will be adequately sequestered under that nice superior V of remaining anterior capsule that we did not disturb, and the lens centers well. We inspect to be sure everything is in good position and there's no cortex left. We're protecting the eye from light whenever possible and making sure we have watertight incisions and the sutures are well covered. Hard to know after my call just where the pupil will end up. Patient did well, three months post-op. He had a YAG laser and was 20-25. But then there was another little minor in. I want to just stop this here for one moment just to point out. So after a little small injury that was uh, arguably important. You can see that the haptic is exposed now through the uh, pupil. And this pupil is not dilated. It has become a little bit bigger in this way. So then my plan, uh, I didn't, I'll let you, I'll let it continue. And uh, I think it's important for you to see how sometimes you just need to have some experience and think on your feet. My goal uh, when I saw this was to quiet the eye again. And then I didn't think this was sustainable. So to go back and my thought was that I would enlarge the posterior capsule uh, opening that I had made with the YAG so that I could capture the optic, assuming, uh, because my assumption was that that, that the lens was no longer uh, stable within the eye, and that's why it had tilted in this fashion uh, to allow the uh, haptic to come forward. But you'll see uh, what we found. Hard to know whether that was related, but it appeared the lens was unstable. 
The inferior edge of the implant was exposed and the haptic was poking through the iris in unsustainable situation. So we brought him back, planning a sutureless 23 gauge vitrectomy, making a sutureless style incision in this manner which does require quite a bit of effort to puncture the globe and therefore did that first when the globe was intact. And my plan uh, was thinking that the lens was unstable uh, to uh, optic capture it by uh, enlarging the posterior rexus that had originally been done with the YAG and removing any anterior vitreous uh, to permit capture of the optic through that opening. I found it challenging to make that big enough, however, and so went to a spout and see what was going on. And I noticed that the lens was extremely stable and that the little dodgeball injury he had had was probably unrelated to the problem, uh, but rather uh, the synechia of the very atrophic iris that had been dialyzed previously had involved the haptic and although throughout the procedure I looked for vitreous and uh, didn't find it early on, uh, despite identification, I did find then the haptic and decided since it was so solid, the lens was so solid, it didn't need it. And so I thought the haptic was simply causing problems and amputated it here. This was uh, thinking on the feet here and then feeling that this iris had to be more taut in order to cover the edge of the implant and to keep it up off of the implant edge uh, and prevent it re -sneaking. I placed two imbricating sutures to make a physiologic pupil using Tenno proline, uh, naturally using locking sutures style sensor. knots to not disturb the tissue and further the, uh, and keep it in situ. Row, this uh, this resulted in a very the physiologic right pupil. And uh, then uh, I reused the vitrector since it was out to remove any viscoelastic and lo and behold at the very end Her this particular identification and never forget to do that along, at the end. You know. Discovered a little wisp of vitreous that maybe had been there with the sneakia all along. Finishing uh, through the trocar with a little further uh, anterior vitrectomy then, uh, we were able to clean that up entirely and uh, prove to ourselves there was none left. Uh, the three little paracentesis, uh, two were watertight, one I sutured, and then the removal of the trocar resulted in a sutureless incision. Our young man has gotten an excellent cosmetic and functional result at 2020 on no meds. I hope this information is of use to you and your so uh, one-year follow-up, uh, off all drops at four months, and uh, uh, IOP was symmetric with the fellow eye, though at the 10-year follow-up, he's already on medication and needs to be closely watched, obviously, for glaucoma. Uh, the best thing was it was not emotionally traumatic for him, and he wants to become an eye surgeon, so hopefully uh, he'll save someone else's eye someday. So uh, avoid irrigation and turbulence, identify structures, maintain chamber, compartmentalize, expose trabecular meshwork, avoid cautery, prepare a patient for more than one surgery. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Open your minds, hone your skills. Let's see if some of us aren't going to become the middle segment surgeons of tomorrow. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to spend whatever time is needed for questions. Thank you Thank so much. You. What a lecture, Professor Abiser. That was super phenomenal. Fellow ophthalmologists, now we mm -hmm. are approaching the question and answer session. So Lisa will read its question for you. There are uh, seven questions so far. The first question from Dr. Morteza Mortaza Vipart from Iran. How do you define the middle segment uh, of the eye? Well, it's two to four millimeters back from the limbus, essentially. So we're, we're talking about that, that area of the retrolenticular space, the, the anterior hyaloid forward to the posterior capsule. Thank you. And then the second question from Dr. Morteza Mortasevi Park, also mm -hmm. from Iran. What is the importance of burger space in cataract surgery? Please. Well, the importance of burger space is that um, is that it gives us, if it's real, it gives us a bit of a cushion to potentially break the posterior capsule and not the anterior hyaloid. Um, there are many potential 
things that we don't really know much about, about burger space. Uh, Marie Jose Tassignon has discovered that certain congenital cataracts, which, uh, which have posterior opacity, actually have an agenesis of burger space, where there is no potential space between the anterior hyoid and the posterior capsule are fused. And that's very important to know, you know, in pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, that is actually the one place where I lost vitreous uh, was in a child that had an intumescent cataract for no known reason and had a posterior, uh, probably this posterior dysgenesis. The importance of it, well, we don't know all that much about it yet, do we? I mean, what happens if Weigert's ligament detaches and that allows then fluid from the aqueous to actually get to behind the, 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 uh, the vitreous? Uh, maybe that causes posterior vitreous detachments. There are all sorts of things. You know, the anterior, uh, uh, the vitreous base and the anterior retina is 100 times finer, uh, thinner than the posterior. And that's where all the aphakic tears occur and so on. Uh, you know, the ciliary body is involved in all of this when we do our endoscopy and, you know, try to shrink the ciliary processes. We're, we're probably rupturing uh, the anterior hyoid um, uh, basement membrane that uh, is continuous in that way. And does that have consequences for why we see inflammation? Uh, it's, it's a fertile area for exploration, and it's an area that we can use to do consider a cataract surgery that never needs a secondary intervention with YAG. All right. Thank you so much. The next question uh, looks like from Indonesia. Do you recommend a continuous infusion? Thank you so much for your answer, Professor. Yes. Uh, I, I don't prefer continuous infusion uh, for a couple of reasons. Well, well on, if you're talking about in standard cataract surgery, I kind of implied that I do like uh, to have some infusion, but needing a second bottle, a second uh, a second incision into the cornea, you know, an extra incision into the cornea, uh, the fact that uh, it can twist or turn or be a problem, you need to know when to turn it on and when to turn it off. I will say in favor of that is uh, when I operated in India for the first time, I expected to see my trace to one plus, you know, cell and flare at, after surgery. And I was shocked to see much more inflammation than that on day one. And they told me that the only uh, eyes that were any more more quiet than mine were uh, actually Dr. the late Dr. Blumenthal's, you know, who who always used a chamber maintainer because basically it's constantly pushing everything out and no uh, germ can come in. So there are those advantages. To me, uh, uh, what I do rather than have continuous infusion. Oh, I, now if you're talking on the FACO, now that maybe I was not answering that properly. So so maybe I was addressing a chamber maintainer, and it just occurred to me that you're talking about continuous infusion with the FACO tip, and I'm very much against that. And the reason is a fewfold. First of all, it's really just an excuse to not learn your foot pedal. And if you the the main reason I think that that it's taught in residencies is to save the coronary arteries of the person teaching. Because if you go into foot position zero at the wrong moment, it's a big problem. <laughs> uh, but the problem with continuous infusion is that if you come out with continuous infusion, you'll encourage the iris to follow, particularly in a floppy iris case and have a lot more iris damage. Secondly, when you go in with continuous con infusion, you can't see and uh, the uh, decimase membrane, uh, the patient under topical will, will, will flinch. Uh, and there's a higher incidence, I believe, of decimase detachment. There are times when you'd like to go to foot position zero inside the eye when you want things maybe to shallow up a tiny bit. So to me, continuous infusion on the FACO machine is a bad idea. On the other hand, allowing the eye to shallow and become hypotensive or the chamber to collapse is also a bad idea, which is why anytime I come out with my irrigation, I go through the paracentesis and manually irrigate fluid till I know it's closed or till I get something else in there. And I, according to what Osher taught us, another person you should hire for this job um, uh, is uh, Bob Osher. Uh, I irrigate my incision before I remove the OBD after the implants in for the final step steps so that the eye won't collapse. Because I think whenever the chamber collapses, and particularly in eyes that are prone to problems like crowded anterior chambers, hyperopic eyes, whenever the chamber collapses, not only is it sucking stuff from the outside in, but it also allows fluid to go elsewhere rather than just deepen it once again and changes all the physiologic relationships within the eye. 
hopefully that was not too long winded and gave you the answer you needed. All right, thank you. Now, uh, I read the comment from Dr. Alan Carlson from Duke University. I'm going to borrow from Howard Kimball that, uh, and refer to the capsular bag after a posterior capsular axis as a capsular tire. Do you have any comments? That's a nice idea. It's a spare tire. Yes, that's true. I, I, I do think of it that way. You know, it's, it's like um, the floats we have in the pools or a spare tire. And your goal is to fill, if you're going to bag and plant an optic capture, is to fill that spare tire with your OBD. So then you have a good landing zone for your lens and can capture the optic below. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. The next question may be from Columbia. Excuse me, Professor, would you like to explain more about dead bag syndromes? Would you like? Thank you. Well, dead bag syndrome, yes, is something that um, if you look in the literature, uh, Liliana Warner and Nick Mamelis have published a wonderful uh, uh, paper uh, on that. I think it's in JCRS. Uh, and um, uh, basically, it looks like over time, certain eyes, for reasons we completely do not understand, will, uh, will just lose all of its epithelial cells. And the bags are diaphanous, totally clear, and totally friable. Uh, so there's no fibrosis whatsoever. And what happens is the lens inside the bag just subluxates because it has no fibrosis or fixation to the bag. And when you go to try to fix it, it's nice to identify this ahead of time, because when you go to try to fix this, you can't lasso that bag. There's no bag to lasso, which is, you know, usually my go to with just a, a normal bag lens subluxation. I'll lasso if the anterior hyloid is intact. That to me is the most important thing. So I won't do a scleral fixation for a subluxated bag lens where the vitreous is not is, is not affected. Um, uh, but but you can't do that with a dead bag. Now there's a lot of research going on now to understand. I mean, it's sort of the opposite of pseudo exfoliation where we get so much metaplasia and fibrotic uh, uh, changes and and uh, contraction of the bag and opacity of the bag, and and no one's really sure why that happens. We're not aware. It, it's been seen with all different types of lenses, so we don't think it's related to lens material, and uh, and it, it remains a conundrum and something important to deal with and a reason that we can lose lenses late uh, to the back of the eye. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, the next question, dear Professor, in what cases will you use capsular hook? This is from Africa, from Sudan. Thank you. Uh, what type of op uh, optic, what type of hook? In what, in what cases will you use? In what cases? Hook? Yeah. In what cases? Uh, well, essentially, the capsular hook is an artificial zonule. So you're going to use it whenever you can't depend on the patient's zonules and you need that stability. And it, 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 it kind of turns a very difficult case into a much easier one to remove lens material from a bag because if the bag is not anchored by the normal zonular anatomy, uh, then it can cause all kinds of complications. And uh, as we discussed, although... Um, in general, traumatic zonular problems tend to be very isolated and don't necessarily unzip that often. It's still possible for them to unzip. If you just think of uh, like a, uh, a regular zipper on your, on your coat or your clothing, you know, when it gets out of line and it's no longer right here, you can just pull it apart easy as can be. And uh, so um, uh, we, we need to stabilize such an eye and not put further pressure. And so when we put these hooks, we're suspending the bag in an artificial way that we wish was the natural normal anatomy. All right, thank you so much. Uh, the next the, uh, question. Uh, if, I, if I might just elaborate, the, uh, uh, the advantage, uh, uh, first of all, it's cheapest to use iris hooks for that, but the angle is wrong and they're not well, uh, they're not well finished on the underside of the hook so that you can sometimes break the capsule, which is a disaster with that. Uh, the ones that I showed, uh, I think they're Yaguchi uh, from Japan, and it's like a hammerhead shark, which I really like because we don't have point pressure. It distributes it, but uh, it's, it's best in a case with 
terrible zonules uh, to use uh, the MST, the Chang modified, so you don't put a, CR, a, C, a CTR through the opening. They've Chang modified it so that uh, the, the MST uh, hooks actually go all, they need a little bigger incision, which is a, a, a tiny issue, and they go all the way out to the equator. So they hold the bag at the equator as well. And for me, I don't like to place a CTR until late. Some people will visco dissect in order to place it and not trap uh, cortex, but my preference is to place it late as I can. All right. Uh, the next question, uh, what kind of forceps do you use to perform posterior CCC? Just uh, uh, Marie Jose prefers the uh, MST uh, one that only opens the inside, so you can put it through a very tiny paracentesis. Uh, I just use my regular Utrata forcep. Um, I, I don't have sharp forceps. I don't think that matters too much. I, I always prefer to control everything as best I can, a control freak, you know. So, uh, uh, but uh, once you get it started, and you don't want to use a cystotome or pinch with the forceps for the posterior capsule, because you don't know if the anterior hyloid might be right underneath. So if you use something that's pointed downward, you might rupture the hyloid while you rupture the capsule. That's why you wanna use a bevel up needle to kind of to kind of ski that up off and create that little uh, flap that then allows you to put the OVD. Um, and then really any, because you have good control of your chamber, you can use a regular Utrata. Um, you know, there's some benefit to a smaller incision uh, forcep because uh, you won't lose OVD out through your incision, you know, but I wouldn't start the case till I know it's all stable anyway. Any, any forcep that isn't sharp. And what uh, what kind of OVD do you, uh, do you recommend, uh, recommend to perform uh, posterior CCC, Professor? Uh, into burger space, I uh, just a cohesive OVD, whatever your favorite. Uh, I used to use uh, uh, no financial interest uh, duovisc, so that I would always have a dispersive and a cohesive. Uh, the provisc and the visco uh, uh, on my table at all times so that I could use them for their best purposes. And that was cost effective compared to just having one. Uh, I would never use a visco adaptive Helon 5 uh, because you must remove all of that because it's high molecular weight and pressure problems uh, that occur as a result. Uh, and uh, although Gimbal first described uh, putting Helon GV uh, through that uh, uh, posterior capsular opening, I, uh, Menapachi just used regular uh, Helon or Provisc, and I think that's best. There's no need uh, for the Helon GV because of the diaphanous nature of the anterior hyloid. It doesn't require that kind of tension to push it back. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe this is the last question from Dr. Asraf. Awaja from Palestine, dropless cataract surgery, is it widely used in practice nowadays? Thank it, you, I, I didn't understand the first, the first part of the question. Uh, the dropless cataract surgery. Dropless, dropless. Yeah. I didn't okay. hear that. Uh, yeah, um, well, I think it's still rather controversial. Uh, you know, uh, payment plans aside and money aside, you know, that's that's kind of an issue. I mean, the main advantage to it, of course, is to avoid poor compliance uh, postoperatively. I have a, a, a certainly intracameral moxifloxacin. I believe it's crazy not to use uh, in every case. Um, uh, there's been uh, one of the articles in the literature for safety for the macula is I published, um, but Arshnoff has the best information and data on that. Um, uh, with regard to steroid uh, and putting steroid inside the eye, I'm, uh, I do not believe we should go transzonular with the uh, steroid um, uh, or a trimoxy or whatever you want to use. Um, I think we don't understand that space. I think going transzonular is a uh, potential issue. If you must go uh, with that into the posterior chamber, I would go pars plana with an injection. I didn't do that. Um, with regard to the depot in the front of the eye, we know that it will uh, cause a problem if it uh, migrates out of the space we want it behind the iris. Um, and um, we don't have a good non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to, uh, to place. I'm a big believer that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are very useful uh, in conjunction with steroid and possibly even more important than steroid in an average case. I started preoperatively because we want to hide the inflammatory experience 
clients, especially if you're doing flax, where you're going to give time for all those prostaglandins to enter, you know, uh, to, to, to be excited. Uh, omidria, I think, is a huge advance, though there are financial barriers to the use of that in many places, uh, in that uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I never tapered steroids for, for cataract surgery because the concept of tapering is that you don't allow the body, you know, you, you fool the body uh, by, by reducing. But, but that implies an endogenous reason for inflammation. Now, we're creating a reason for inflammation. We are operating on this eye. We're opening the posterior capsule, exposing antigenic material to the eye. Well, we want to slam that inflammation. And then we want to quit slamming it <laughs> when it doesn't, it's not needed anymore. So I, I personally, I'm not sure that we need topical antibiotic. If we're using properly, we're using intracameral moxifloxacin. Kaiser doesn't use topical anymore, and there's no proof that it does help. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, with regard to NSAIDs, I think they're still very important. We have multiple ways to place steroid in the eye. None of them is really ideal. So if we have good, compl reasonable compliance and good instructions, it's a short time that we need it. I'm still in the drop category. Thank you so much. So marvelous. Many questions have been answered by our super maestra at this very moment. Great speaker, great audiences. So incredible. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Well, we are here spreading love, care, peace, and tranquility on earth. Thank you, SMEC Group, Anak Sudarti Foundation. Thank you, all committee, Dr. Diahin Medan, and Hafiz in Jakarta. Thank you, our distinguished participants from Palestine, USA, Iran, Bangladesh. Italy, Malaysia, Indonesia, Ghana, Ukraine, Singapore, India, Colombia, Serbia, Lebanon, Myanmar, Rwanda, Bahrain, Argentina, Sudan, Egypt, and Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, all our distinguished participants. And to our maestra, Professor Lisa Arbiser, Please send our regard to your family. Thank you so much, Lisa. You are absolutely awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And may not uh, be too late. Happy Independence Day to our to your nation and country. God bless America. May we stay strong and democratic. Thank you. Thank you. And furthermore, fellow participants. The certificate for this webinar will be sent hopefully for, uh, before two weeks. Before two weeks. And your participation is truly appreciated. See you all. Thank you so much, all of our great friends from all around the world. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.